Hey everyone and welcome to the Business of, of Sports Show. I'm Matt Ruddle. Today we roll on to the next episode with probably the guy with the longest name in rugby history. Uh, he's an interesting character. It is none other than Rupert Moon. I'll let him introduce his full title. I, I do know it uh, because I read his book, Cover to Cover. Uh, but yeah, Rupert, thanks for joining us today. No, no problem. It is Rupert Henry Sinjin Barker Moon. Yeah, bit of a there we go. Twister there. It wasn't a great life being a kid. I'll tell you that with a name like that. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure it was all good fun. So, so Rupert, for all the people that, that don't necessarily know who you are, I mean, as a big Scarlet's fan myself, uh, as I said, I read your book Full Moon, available in the shops. Uh, you know, me. <laughs> <laughs> You buy one, you get one free. Uh, t- yeah, let, let's talk about your history. So, so you know, who are you and, w- and what have you done? Okay, so um, if we recap, I'll be really quick. So I, I used to play football and rugby. And then I finished playing rugby. And uh, at the same time as playing rugby, I got a degree in government and politics or public admin. And then I went from there, worked in a, for an independent TV company, Then I evolved into um, working for Steve Hansen uh, when he was in charge of the national squad, having just been handed over by Graham Henry as like a little sacrificial lamb to to go and to help him. And then working for David Moffat at the WRU uh, and Paul Sargent at the Millennium Stadium, became head of commercial there. Um, Went from there, uh, handed over to Roger Lewis for a little while, who then told me to go and do something else. So I worked then for a venture capital company, buying up insurance businesses and working in some marketing, which was good. Then I came back to work for um, Roger Lewis again. Um, oh, no, in between time, sorry. I worked for the Scarlet's as commercial director for a favour to the chairman at the time. We put a few million quid into the place to help Parker Scarlet's feel like home. Um, and then after doing that for three years, Roger Lewis came back and asked me to set up a team in North Wales which I did, and then came back from there and helped uh, another WRW construction company uh, insert their CSR, uh, Corporate Social Responsibility Project, and developing relationships and systems for them, did that for a few years. And then now I work for a property group that's helping them as a strategy director grow and develop alongside uh, advising and doing some support to a uh, a fibre company based out of North Wales, in simple terms. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and you kind of you didn't even kind of gloss over the fact that you you played rugby, international rugby, and, and everything. Yeah, so I played <laughs> two hundred and seventy-two times for the Scarlets, twenty-four times for Wales. I had a season with Neath before that, three seasons with Abertillery before that, and I was brought up uh, in the Black Country uh, in the Midlands, as it's affectionately known. Um, uh, and yeah, I left at seventeen. So um, I, I, I was going to say, people might notice uh, the, the the strong Welsh accent uh, coming from you. Yeah. Uh, so 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 let's kind of you know dial it back you know to the start then. So how how did you end up on on, on that side of the bridge um, and playing rugby? Yeah, basically, we lived next to the rugby club where I was brought up in Warsaw, and um, Dad was involved with the club, Mom was involved with the club, so I used to play in the dead ball area by the lights of the, the, the clubhouse in the evenings at uh, the weekends. And then uh, I played football uh, on a Sunday, I played rugby on a Sunday morning, football on a Sunday afternoon. But then I was involved in the school. We played Saturday morning soccer and then I'd play on a Wednesday rugby. And then I'd mark the pitches out, sort the jerseys out with my dad on a Friday night. And on a Saturday afternoon, I'd run the touch and uh, did that for years but my influences were people who were playing for the first team. So when I was sitting in this corner of the dressing room, listening to team talks and inspirational words, they were from Welsh people because in the late 60s, 70s, um, lots of Welsh people had come to the teacher training college, which was the other side of the rugby club. So my house, (laughs) teacher training college, rugby club. So the first team was full of Welsh people from anywhere from Newport all the way to Clathley and uh, up to, to Mid Wales. And they were my influences. And uh, the guy who had the biggest influence on me was a guy who played for Clathley against South Africa in 1970 at fullback. And nice. um, kicked some kicks, but 
missed the kick, unfortunately, to win the game from the touchline to beat South Africa. And they drew in that game. But he was great friends with Gareth Jenkins. And it is bizarre that he was my first fly half in senior game. And then he was the man that got me and helped me to get to the Scarlets in, uh, many years later. Fantastic. And, and as you said, you, you played a number of times for, for the Scarlets. And you know I, I remember going down with my dad and watching... Uh, even at your testimonial game and, and everything like that. And it, it was fantastic. But what, what was that kind of experience like? Look, to play in a place steeped in history and heritage was beyond my wildest dreams. You know, I sat in the club in Warsaw, listening to Hamilton Jones and others, Arne Evans from Sandry Hangelalaf and uh, Mike Lewis from Aslevera talking about what it was like to play in Clearly and the reputation and the history that goes back 120 odd plus years. Um, it was a pipe dream. I, I never thought I was ever going to play, you know, first team rugby, let alone play for a, such a historical, uh, famous club as that. So to be allowed to pull on the jersey and borrow it for, for 272 times over 12 years was beyond my wildest dreams. And the team I played in and some of the players I played with was remarkable. And, they're, you know, I've still got some amazing friends. And so I've privileged to have been in part of some incredible in occasions, which I think I've only just become a supporter. And I only went to the World Cup in Japan with Gareth Jenkins and realised what it's like to be a fan. Because I played rugby from the age of five. Yeah, I played all the way through. And when I wasn't playing, I was either a sub or injured. When I finished playing, I worked for the Welsh team. Then I worked for the governing body. Um, and then I worked for the Scarlets. And then I worked for RGC and up in North Wales. So I'd never actually been a fan because yeah. I've always been involved in either commercially or from a playing point of view. But to go to Japan, myself and Gareth Jenkins, who's like my adopted father, we were just blown away by the experience of just the occasion of the pre-match the night before, not worrying about any involvement, the morning of the game, the breakfast, chatting, the, 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 you know, the preparation, going to the game, you know, without a care in the world, otherwise obviously wanting the team to win, but just the, the whole experience. And we, we feel like we've missed out all our lives. And I was with him at lunchtime today and we reminisce about that trip to Japan. And that was my awakening to what it was and how important, supporters fans are to every club and every country yeah I, I, totally and and it kind of reminds me of um the first international i went to was wales argentina in 99 the opening game of the rugby world cup oh. um we, we managed my parents managed to get one ticket and it was my birthday a few days later so obviously i ended up with a ticket uh, i've sat next to a guy with a six foot leak um, but that's another story um but my mum had always said before beforehand, I can't see why people go to these places if they haven't got a ticket for the game. And actually, afterwards, she was absolutely buzzing. She she loved the atmosphere, you know. And again, a, a city on on match day, there's just that buzz and that atmosphere. And I think, yeah, you know, I, I totally get what you said in terms of you've been you've been on the other side of the fence. Yeah. You've been, you know, you, you've. You've had to go to the, you know, the, these things normally because you've either been managing, playing, or, or you know, whatever. But actually taking that time and seeing it from the other side, where it's just a different kettle of fish. It's the atmosphere. The World Cup was brilliant in Japan, and just being yeah. in a bar or in a restaurant or just being on the streets and the mm -hmm. tidal wave of people and just the emotion that just builds with the occasion. And, that, and yeah. that's the thing when you you're in a bubble of being a part of the team. You're just transfixed. You're on a bus. You see the crowd and you get a sense of it. You're on the field and, yes, you see faces and hear the noise and are inspired and motivated by that. Yeah. But it is such a unique occasion. and It is so addictive. You know, we're hoping yeah. to go back again to the Lions in um, to South Africa in the summer. And I can't wait. We're going to go together again because life experiences, and I cherish that. I cherish those moments. And, and in business, when I was working for the Scarlets and for the WRU, it was always about the people, the journey, the experience that you had to care about the detail. I understand now what it means. I did. It was important then. But actually, from a practical, personal point of view, I so get it even more now. Oh, oh totally. But let's, let's kind of go back to your, your, your playing days, because, I mean, your background there is, is 
good old um, Stradley Park. Yeah. It's the north north stand, isn't it? Yeah. So I think my season ticket is probably just over your uh, your left shoulder somewhere. Um, what was it like playing at, at such a, a kind of an iconic ground? I mean, in, you know, talking to to Sean Fitzpatrick a couple of weeks ago, and and even talking to to other players, you know from around the world, Straddy seems to have been this, this, this thing. And, and for all the people who are watching who, who don't necessarily know about the Scarlets or anything, you know, Straddy Park was the, the home ground of Clare and the Scarlets. And it was just, it was a fortress uh, on, on match days when it was absolutely packed and everybody was singing. It was just, just an atmosphere. But what was it like on the pitch? As a, as a player going to the place, it, you know, as you say, its reputation is world renowned. You know, yep. the, the, I think the town of Athletics only got about 25,000 people and you add in Buddy Port and, and Langenich, you might get to 40,000 and the whole county of Carmarthen has only got 115,000 people. But that little that little place that was built up, as you say, over 100 and plus years was, a, was a, literally a, a halcyon fortress. You know, in my 12 years, I think I lost 18 home games, which is, when I think about it, it's bonkers. 18 yeah. home games and it... Uh, those games um, that we won were because of what the people behind me that made us bigger and stronger and faster than we actually were and inspired us and motivated to be better than we could have, should have been. And those moments when the pressure came on, you know, the big occasions, European games, local derbies, um, and the, those were iconic. But also when we played international sides, you know, playing against... South Africa and Australia and New Zealand and those teams that would come there. And, you know, we were a town team. It's a, a town. So it wasn't yeah. a region. Everybody talks about in those days, you know, we represented West Wales. We did to a degree, but it, we, we still had players from those clubs in the West who were a bit upset that we would take a player from Tembe or take a player from Narbeth because Clatley was a, t- a town team. Now, we were punching above our weight. Um, yeah. All our lives, Clefley has. And But to step out and go well, to step in the dressing room was unique because when I first went there, where do you sit? I sat yeah. in the corner and you go in, I sat in the corner. And then uh, an unlikely, well, yeah, an unlikely looking individual known as Lawrence Delaney um, towered over me with his shape and odd bits that would hang out and dangle in various places and told me to move from the position I was in, because I real I didn't realise that Phil May had one side of the corner and Lawrence Delaney had the other, because there was a heater above, and you earned the right. Now those guys had been there five hundred plus games, so yeah. it took me three years to get near the corner. It took me ten years to get to the corner, and that was two hundred and seventy two games. Now you earn the right for a corner, and it is yeah. bizarre, but when you walk out onto that field. You know, it is incredible. The stadium was nothing special. It was about the people that made it yeah. special. It wasn't a, you know, unique design or anything of like that, but it was the atmosphere that the people created by generation and generation being passing on to show the passion that it meant to inspire us on the field of play. Do you miss that? Um, people do ask me, and I... I I always, I always felt a bit of an imposter. So I always thought I would, this would be my last game. Even though in my second season I was made captain, I always felt I wasn't the you know at school I wasn't the best player in the team. I wasn't the guy that starred. I didn't have special skills. I, I wasn't great at kicking. I certainly wasn't great at passing. I wasn't bad about body flopping along the field and dive passing. I tried yeah. hard. I tried hard. I never gave up. But I wasn't. There were better players better scrum halves um, that, that had less success. Um, so I, I, I look back and go, actually, I achieved more than my wildest dreams. So I feel I got away with it. So actually, do I miss it? Actually, I, I, I you know, eight cup finals, I won six. You know, I'm not, I didn't do too bad. And then we had some yeah. lots of famous games. So actually, I, I'm, I'm happy with my lot. I'm happy with my lot. I'm looking forward to, um, new experiences. So I'm content with that chapter. Turn the page. That was great. But I, I, I don't think you could ever replicate it again. Yeah. And you said about great, great occasions. 
obviously, we've only recently, uh, it was the anniversary of that famous victory against Australia in 92. So, <laughs> 28 know, years. <laughs> it's mad. Tw- tw- 28 <laughs> years. Crazy. Excuse so, me. <coughs> when so, you think so, about it, it's mad when you think it's that yeah, long tw- ago. Tw- 28 years ago. I mean, it, okay, it's quite shocking. It, you know, it makes everybody feel a bit older, but, but, I mean, talk about talk to us about that game and and that that, that atmosphere and and you know just just winning that game because do you, do you think that a, a, a club side or a regional side these days would a face an international team and b actually win? Um, no and no. <laughs> I think I think that's the I think the modern game, the professional nature, the way that times have changed. That was then. This is now, and I think. Um, what we were able to do then, and other teams, uh, you know, I'm not being disrespect- disrespectful to other teams, you know, Newport have beaten teams, uh, Cardiff have beaten teams, Swansea have beaten teams. Uh, we're the smallest of all. You know, those yeah. are cities. We're a town. A town team beat at that time the wor- the current reigning world champions with a team packed full of John Eels, Willie Offengawi, you know, all of these players that were playing on Saturday. OK, other teams did it, but we did it on a Saturday and it wasn't supposed to happen. And the occasion was so unique. We were very fortunate that Ray Gravel gave us a team talk on the Thursday before. He'd been watching Australia training under, under the guise of the BBC. Thank you very much. So we knew kind of things. We had some amazing coaches, you know, with Gareth Jenkins, Alan Lewis, Peter Herbert that made us uh, the fittest and the most skillful and creative in the way that we were doing it. And the players that we had, you know, we had amazing internationals, Yian, Phil Davis, you know, Copsey, Lynn Jones, Emmy Lewis, um, Mark Perigo. You know, they, Scott, I just look when I think back at that and I think, you know, the players that we had, it was like a, it was like a very fortunate, like an international team. Yeah. And the, the morning of the game in the Ashburnham Hotel, you know, where we were fired up by Gareth Jenkins and it was always about playing for the people. It inspired us for remembering it's not about us, it's about them. It's about the reputation that this town will have on the global stage and we will perform for them, not us, and don't ever forget that. And, they, yeah, it, Colin Stevens doing, you know, five foot five, <laughs> diminutive character, great cricketer, fast bowler, doing what he did in the last few minutes of the game. He'd missed a couple of goal, drop goals, but then to do... And I I hadn't watched it in its entirety probably until for a few years ago, but just to remember yeah. that we were down with a few minutes to go and then for, to, for him to drop those two goals, to clear do those clearance kicks like he did, was incredible. Um, and yeah, by the grace of God we go. There was a bit of divine intervention when the ball was... Wobbling, it looked like it was going under the crossbar, but then everybody in the uh, the push end blew, and the, the ball went over the crossbar. And uh, I managed to hit his hands, his target for once with a little bit of a dive pass. And Yian um, going under the post early on as well with that move of theirs. And uh, he lived to regret it because I made him chest, yeah. and uh, it's haunted him ever since. I can imagine, but that that had to be a kind of great feeling. But you know what happened next then? So so you know when you retired, you know. Oh well, actually, actually, let's let's kind of go back a little bit because, as you said, you know, you, you, you're from the black country, yeah, and then you played for Wales. Yeah, I just, and I don't know. Look, I when I think back, I was playing for uh, for Athletic for the Scarlets, and we we were doing well at that time. We were hit a rich vein of form. Um, what every coach hopes for that you know the eclectic mix that they try and squish together comes together at the same time. And that 92, 93 season was it where I think eight of us played for Wales at the same time. <clears throat> and Wales at the time were, were coming out of a tough period in the late eighties. Um, Alan Lewis, uh, Alan Davis had taken over um, and the pack weren't doing what they needed to do at the time. Cause you need a set piece and they needed someone like me. Robert Jones was a fantastic and a legend of Welsh rugby had had that incredible tour with the Lions in Australia, which I'd watched. Um, and he was playing behind a pack that didn't give him the platform that he deserved. So they yeah. looked for someone that I fitted the bill. And I was different at the time. There were other scrum there were very similar in style, 
to rob. Um, but there wasn't someone who took a kick in like me <laughs> and who could get in and out and didn't mind doing the dive pass to get it in and away. And uh, Alan, Lewis, Alan Davis' style of play was use space, keep the ball alive, bit of creativity in the midfield. We had Nigel Walker and Yian Evans on the wings. We had Nigel Davis in the centre playing a little bit. And we took an opportunities with Neil Jenkins as our kicker, winning the championship in, in 94. So, um a great experience and a successful one at the time, but then to be dropped when Alan Lewis, even though we qualified for the World Cup, having not the, the year before, uh, 91 had had a, been a tough time, to be left out for 95 and Alex Evans taken over and 10 of us, I think, or 11 of us got dispatched and yeah. uh, thought never to play again. And then five years later, Graham Henry picked up the phone, which was quite bizarre. <laughs> to a 32-year-old bloke with old bits that ached and struggled. But again, Held together by tape. Yeah, but he needed someone. And that was, again, all because the team were doing well in 99, as in, clearly, we'd had a good run in Europe. Yeah. Um, I was able to make decisions in key games um, and not be afraid to, because I was older and a little bit wiser. And at that time, that's what the Scarlet's Lethley needed. And Wales uh, were looking to blood some new players, Stephen Jones, Shane Williams, and Graham Henry asked me to be the old guy in the middle um, to just steady the ship when it would, obviously under pressure of 70 odd thousand people and millions of people watching would... Yeah be one of those things that you, you you only get experience by getting experience and yes. uh, and that's where even though I had that chance I wasn't afraid because I thought it, I'd only have one so I'd get one game so I might as well make the most of it but then one led to another that led to another and I had a nice run for a few years before handing the baton on to someone else yeah I, I remember that but what do you do you ever think what if you know if you had the call from the, the other side of the bridge? Uh, well, I was picked in the uh, England squad in 89-90, Jeff Cook. So I'd played through the England system um, and my, I captained the divisional team, Midlands division, um, and we'd won the championship. I dislocated my shoulder in the last um, game and my brother took my place, bizarrely. But my <laughs> team was Martin Johnson, Dean Richards, Neil Back, Cockrell, you know, we had a pack of forwards and it was, a, it was an armchair ride yeah. and I was captain of that team. Um, and Jeff Cook had picked me in the big squad to go to Argentina and Australia, but wanted me to be playing in England. And I had chance to, I went to Harlequins, I went to Northampton to meet them. And it is difficult to explain to an Englishman what it's like to play in Wales. Yeah. And, and a, you know, I, I couldn't choose where I was born, but I could choose where I play and where I live. And that was one of the key things. And my brother said, where would you be happiest most if you weren't playing international rugby? And I was very content at Abertillery. <laughs> I was loving, yeah. I loved my upbringing there. I loved the time that I played there. And it was character building. It was real rugby, real people who had real jobs and struggles, but enjoyed and lived for that Saturday and the pride in the jersey for what it meant. And that was a great being born again in Abertil areas, I'd call it. And then the, the, the kind of coming of age in Neath, where the rough and rugged nature of what it was, and we dominated and scared the life out of everybody because of what we had. The Jeremy Pugh, the Brian Williams, the Kevin Phillips, the Paul Jackson, the Phil Pugh, the Roland Phillips, Lynn Jones, Paul Thorburn, Alan Bateman, Colin Leighty. You know, they, we were a, a fierce and frightful group. Mark Jones at number eight. And then... Yeah the refinement of the Scarlets. So that journey was just an incredible one. But at that time, mine was about, I was just wanted to play rugby in Wales. That's why I came to Wales, to play rugby in Wales. I didn't ever think or believe that I would play international rugby, either for England or for Wales. So my contentment was just to play where I was happiest, which was where people believed in it and loved it as much as I did. So when they had that option and I didn't want to go and live in England, it was kind of the door shut. Naturally, yeah. I, you know, there were other, Richard Harding, Richard Hill, um, Dowie Morris. There were great, good quality scrum over there. But I was going to Wales to play in Wales. And in front of me, it was unrealistic because Robert yeah. Jones, one of the greatest scrum Wales has ever had, was the incumbent. So 
I wasn't coming to play for Wales. I was coming to play in Wales. And then yeah. a piece of the jigsaw fell in my favour and I was very fortunate. Well, you've got to take the opportunities when they come, isn't it? And, and you know, again, it's you make the most of them. Um, well, otherwise, pr- you end up regretting. Well, I prove the impossible is possible because even if you haven't got the skill set and the dexterity that some have, that you still can make it because rugby... It is about, and like in business, it is about having everybody with different in different shapes and sizes. I lose yeah. it in the jigsaw piece in business as well, that they've all they all got to fit together. So it's not always about the best players. It's the best eclectic mix that come together to create that sweetness that is everybody being on the same page, going in the same direction, and then you can achieve what we did, which was – be successful. But you look at Leicester City in football, you know, they didn't necessarily have the best players, but they had the team that all worked together, gelled, got on, and, and worked to, towards the, the same goal rather than um, anything else. Yeah, resilience, uh, never say die, never giving up, you know, collective spirit that keeps going. And that that is half the battle, is, is how big is your, how big is your heart? And I think that's the, the challenge. How do you put that in people? There are certain you're born with it. You can't yeah. artificially inseminate it. You you know you are the person that you when you grow up by the people that you're mixing with. So teammates at junior sections, the the clubhouse that you hang around with, the friends that you have shape the people person I am. So yeah, yeah my mom and dad had influence, but the rugby club had a huge influence. The friends that I grew up with, and then the teams I played in. Because yeah. if I didn't get up against Abercrave in the cup when I fractured my pelvis and we were winning 10-6 and they told me to get up rather than go off, then I, that should be in good stead. It's how, how much pain you could suffer for the rest of your team. You know, yeah. losing away in Nanty Fratlon for Abertaleri was a, like a humiliating experience. They, but seeing what it meant to Nat- Nanty Fratlon and how mad and crazy it was for them to beat us, but the everything that came against us and not being afraid and just you've got to stand up for what you believe in. And and I think that stood me those lessons in life stood me in good stead, I think. Well well let's let's fast forward to, to your time after rugby then and, and about you know you know your your endeavors as commercial director of the Scarlets and, and you know well, yeah, group, yeah. group commercial and uh business development for the WRU and all, all that. How how did how did that transition kind of, you know, feel and, 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 you know, kind of what, what kind of things were you doing there? So well, firstly, the one with, um, when I finished with Graham Henry, he was the one that said, thanks very much. Had a glass of red wine um, and asked me to look, could I help Steve Hansen? And um, Steve was a top man. And he asked me to try and create a brand around the national team. So he was always a believer in control, what you can control so I was helping and working, and I was the first ever ex-player, ex-international, to be a water carrier. So basically, Graham Henry got me to do that, to pass on messages when I finished. Yeah. Um, so I was, when Graham was developing new players, I was going into the huddle to try and calm people down, but I was taking messages uh, on to the players because I was able to do that in a and deliver the message in a particular way. It became the vogue then. Other players started to do it and using that. Um, then I worked for Steve Hansen, and Steve was about brand, collective spirit, creating control in that area. Then working with the WRU, the, um, Paul Sargent was the, hair, the chief executive of the stadium. We got connected. He then asked me to help him. They were in a challenging position because... It had cost them a lot, to not as much as you would have thought, to build the stadium, but there was a lot of debt. Um, yeah. They made some promises that they couldn't keep. So he asked me to help through business development. And then him and Steve Lewis created a group role. And through David Moffat, asked me to help the WRU and the stadium, which was a great initiation. And he, he gave me chances to create a team off the field. And what yeah. was so satisfying, he said, you're going to have bloody noses. You're going to make mistakes. Um, but he wants you to make decisions. And I created a team, and I'm very proud that um, Craig Maxwell, a kid I employed, is now the head of commercial for the WRU and is just moving on to the Six Nations. Tracy Lloyd is head of hospitality, the Millennium Experience, who 
I inherited and we developed and grew together. Alex Leff is a key man based on the events and bringing some incredible events to the stadium. Three key people that were in the team that I helped develop and create. And together, we grew into that role. So it's very satisfying. And I was very lucky. And then Roger Lewis and David Moffat was um, very supportive. Roger Lewis came in um, and, gave, and gave his his advice to get other experiences and took me and put me in a different place and out of my comfort zone in um, insurance and, and buying up businesses. And it was, it was something I really am very glad that he did both Moffat and Roger Lewis. So that was those unique experiences. And then the journey continued to come back to the, to the Scarlets to help Parker Scarlets feel like home because it's a fabulous place, but it wasn't Straddy. And yeah. uh, I think we all, we, it was, I went door to door on Denham Avenue when we were moving from Straddy for Stuart Gallagher. He asked me as an ex-player if I would help deliver the message. And I wasn't working for the for Tlethley. I wasn't working for the Scarlets, but I used to go after work and try to explain to people that it, we had to move for yeah. our future. It wasn't a financial viability to stay where we were. The deal that was struck um, was better. And for the longevity for another hundred years, we needed to move. And it was, there was some resistance, but I still believe it was the right thing. But <clears throat> the planning inquiry, moving mid-season, uh, the challenges um, was difficult. And a friend of mine, Hugh Evans, had put millions in. Philip Davis had put millions in. And we just had to connect back with the fans um, to help it make feel like home. And I'm I'm proud that we did. I know three years I did put in, I think it became a better place because of the people got what was we were trying to do. Yeah, and I, and I think that's, that's always going to be the way, isn't it? That, um, you know, when you move from what you've already got, which is, is already a place steeped in history and, and people are used to it, to somewhere brand new, the atmosphere doesn't just move over. You can move the players, you can move the, the, the computers and, and the furniture, but the atmosphere and the fans don't necessarily move over. And one of the things that we, one of the first things I did was talk to the people <laughs> front up and that yep. was to the patrons, that was to the sponsors and that was to the supporters. Uh, and I created the biggest clubhouse in the world, which was the indoor training barn. Because yep. the problem was with Stradi, you had those, obviously those bars and you had the social club and people gathered in the car park. When we went to the new place, there wasn't, there wasn't the same. It wasn't the same. So yeah. we created a venue in that indoor training area for a thousand people to get together before a game. Then yeah. me and the chief executive would stand in the middle of that before and after a game. Nigel Davis was the coach and we reinvested in young talent. Um, and we had to, because we had to take a million out of the business and, and we had to, people like um, Keith Muse and others had to leave and they invested in Jonathan Davis, Reese Priestland uh, and others of that nature, Scott Williams, and those players that people could connect with because they were from the locality. They'd come through our academy and development system. And we got the stewards we brought back in-house and we asked them to be supporters too. So mm. when they're coming in, it's that welcoming nature that it was. Even though they were, uh, they used to be volunteers in Stradi, we had to get SIA accredited ones. But in fairness to them, they were became more personable and friendly. Yeah. They didn't become detached as they were, you know, and we asked them to be one of us, which was supporters, the staff behind the bar. The detail was the hog roast man. There was the the, the pancake man, you know, uh, all of the things that made it feel like home. Couldn't control yeah. what was on the field, but the detail was we all care. And the seat that you sit in that your dad may have sat in or your mum might have sat in in Stradi, is now yours to pass on, to pass on, to pass on. And yeah. the results eventually came and the style came, but it was tough. you got to front up. And uh, when people don't like what they want to hear, you still can't be afraid to say with some conviction that you believe this is the right thing to do. And yeah. that's all you can do. I, you got to make a decision. Someone's going to make it the same on the field of play. It's easier not to. It's easy to hide. Yeah. But front up and say it how it is, and then if people don't like it, it's their choice then. 
Yeah, and, and and you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. At the end of the day, and and moving across and and building that atmosphere, and and I totally get that in terms of you know, building up the the local talent because people, again, I had the same con- kind of conversation with um, Sean Fitzpatrick in terms of your rugby players have always been seen as approachable, and and the fact that uh, you know Jonathan Davis and and you know he's called Foxy and his you know brothers Kobe <laughs> Boy, you know it's because that their parents owned a pub, you know local pub okay. and that. It, it, exactly, and and I mean, I I, I said to to um, to Sean Fitzpatrick about I, I can't remember what what game we we've come down to, but thanks to my mum's photography skills, she'll hate me for saying this. I had my photo with the uh, the Heineken Cup and Celesi for now um, multiple times. She just couldn't take a photo. Saw him in Tesco's the next day buying oranges and still said hello and and had a conversation. And I think that's the whole thing of building that community. Well, there's two things that I did. Well, I did as a player. As a player after the game, you used to walk the walk of shame or the walk of fame, and that on was the pitch, upstairs. Yeah. So you after oh. the after the game, there was everybody came on the field at halftime and after. So you yeah. had to walk of shame or walk of fame off the field of play. Then you had to get your food, which was upstairs in the patrons' lounge, and the food was at the far end. So you had to walk through all these people who would have an opinion and uh, and uh, deservedly have an opinion. So you'd have it on the field with all the fans and supporters, you'd have it after the game and there was no shying away. You had to stay for food. And when we moved to, when I became commercial director of the Scarlets in the new stadium, I made the players with the support of the coach, Nigel, to have the food at the far end of the Quinnell Lounge. So they had to manoeuvre through the tables and sponsors and partners and be approachable. Then they had to go to the boxes if you were injured. Then you would have to do some appearances if you weren't involved after the game, prior to the game in that biggest clubhouse in the world, in the indoor training arena. We had to be, and it was character building for the players because not everybody liked to. You didn't want yeah. to, you played badly. You didn't want to front up and you wanted to get in your car and hide away. But you had to go and do it. And, you you know, these now were paying your wages. People were paying your wages and they would sometimes vent their spleen, quite rightly. But it's, again, dealing with the confrontation understanding what it means and resonating through when you're thinking, am I going to get to that tackle? Am I going to make it? Am I going to get there? And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm remembering some father and son or father and daughter vehemently saying how much it meant to them because yep. they use their hard-earned cash to come to the game. And I reflect back, I sat and when you're, a, I played over 250 times and you get a seat for life. And I'm very privileged to have that in that stadium. And I, sat with my son and daughter at the La Rochelle game in the European Cup a few years ago. Yeah. I was very lucky to be with them in that position, looking down in that stadium, and it was a full house, and the occasion was incredible. And that was where the moment I felt like Parker Scarlets became home. It, the transformation, uh, transformation of from Stradi to then had taken many years, but that was with the help of the, the supporters, the commercial partners, the staff, but most of all, the players, it all came into that sweet spot in that game. And I was there to witness it. And it was, it was, a, it was a chilling moment, but a very proud moment that we've, we've all, like you, having your photo with Salesi Fino, who yeah. we're still talking to in Australia, we've all played a part in creating the jigsaw that makes us the, the club that we are across the world. And those occasions are just memorable, aren't they? Just memorable. Yeah, and, and and you must look back now of, of you know having a moment like that, and knowing that you had a hand in that creation um, of laying the foundations, uh, because somebody had, you know you had to start somewhere. Yep. And, in order and, and to have these these experiences. And that's and, and I and in, in business is the same, and, and you it's a blank piece of paper. It's a yeah. what is it about? What is it about? It's a you know, and that's going back to the team talks that. Gareth Jenkins used to give us Phil Davis and the advice that he would Phil May, Lawrence Delaney, you know, those are the people and Nigel that are coming back and how you shape it. You've got to start somewhere. You've got to make, make a decision. And if it doesn't feel right, it ain't right. <laughs> you know, then you will make mistakes. But if you're doing it with the best intentions and you're passionate about it and you believe in it, then, it, you know, it, it'll, it will come right. It's amazing. I, you know, the, the, the 
the senior people I've worked with, chief executives like Moffitt, like Roger Lewis, who have been successful, um, and they talk about planning and, and you know believe in the future and have a vision. And uh, you know, you write down what do you what do you think? Where do you see the end game? And my dad used to do this thing about creative visualization. And you were nervous before games, and he'd, he'd say, "You picture it, see it, seeing is believing." And I would play those games in my mind and how it was. Nervous that I would make a mistake and not be skillful enough to make it happen. But there was one thing I always had was get up and keep going. Get up and keep trying. Get yeah. up. Never give up. Someone clonks me or, or make a mistake. Have another go. Try and put it right. And so that endeavor, and the same in business. You know, I'll, you know, I, I listen to Richard Branson. He all the times he's failed, he's failed yeah. many times, many times. And you don't ever see those failures. But it is about giving people the opportunity to to learn from their mistakes. And that's as a player, and the same in business. It, it it's support people as you're growing and developing, but it's as long as you don't keep repeating the same mistake and the yeah. sign of insanity is thinking you're going to have a different outcome by doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah. Very, very true. Yeah. So sometimes you have a sweet one and, it, and that hurts. And then remember how much it hurts. So no, you don't do it again. Very true. Well, I mean, that, that it's almost like we planned this, but that, that kind of brings us smoothly on to, to something I ask every guest yep. of the program. And I kind of gave you a few minutes warning, literally when we jumped on, saying about three three bits of advice that you would give to people that that can kind of you know work in sport, but also in business as well, or, or even in in, in life. Sure. You know, what would they be? I, I think the first one is uh, make make a decision. <laughs> make a decision. Yeah. Whatever decision you make is the right one, whether because you've made it. So just make a de- decision. You know, think about it, consider it, but then make a decision. Yeah. And I think the other one is don't be afraid to make a mistake. It's okay. People make mistakes. Don't keep making mistakes is the biggest mistake. So don't yeah. think things are going to change. If you keep making the same mistake, it ain't going to change the outcome. So make mistakes, but learn from those mistakes. And then the third one is people Whatever any walk of life you're in, we're all in the people business. So we are in the people business. So if you find a good person, and I'm saying a good person in the round terms, you can get them to do anything. So you, if you find and you feel that you've connected with a person, and I do, we used I used to go off CVs and all of the stuff, and it's nice to have the credentials and all of that experience. But the biggest thing is that connection and you know that person, whether it's in a, a teammate, is going to give you everything. Is going to give you everything. And you don't mind if they make mistakes, if they're a good person. And I think what Gareth Jenkins taught me as a player is that all these different players might be different skill sets, different abilities, different desires. But if they're good and they'll all give it everything, that's the matters. And in business, if you find and connect with a good person, then you can grow they can grow and shape and develop and believe in those good people. So I think those are the things. Make decisions. Don't be afraid to make mistakes, but we're all in the people business. So you want to work with people that you enjoy working because it's about smiling. At the moment, I'm enjoying working with people. It's challenging. It's bloody hard. Yeah. Life is tough. You know, shit happens. People die. People, things happen. Um, businesses go pear-shaped. But you've got to keep going, keep going, keep going. And then, but working with people that you like working with, and that's good people. Yeah, see, uh, all, all fantastic tips. And, and again, I think, you know, I think in business, there's a lot of, of blame culture, which is why people are so afraid to make decisions and make mistakes. Um, and there's a great book. Uh, I, I'm, I forgot it um, on, on a previous one, but it's Black Box Thinking by Matthew Said, where it's all about, not having that blame culture but it's the the people one that you mentioned i think is quite relevant uh there was a story that came out a, about a week or so ago about a guy who basically his job interview you know didn't go so well because he went into to the reception area and wasn't very nice to the receptionist who actually happened to be the recruitment manager 
because you should treat people how you want to be treated and whether they're, they're, they're the people on reception or whether they're, they're the people in the boardroom i think people people get on with people and and if you can master that skill look look and i had a letter and i'll never forget there was a guy by the name of tom lyons tom lyons used to work for the daily express back in the day he was a boxing reporter and a sports reporter and um he, gave, he wrote me a little letter and I remember speaking to him after a game at Abitaleri and he said, you're going to be a great player, a good player. You're going to go on and you're going to play you know, big games. But don't ever forget to give people time. Wherever, whatever it is, people are going to want to spend and talk to you. Yeah. That will be their moment. Don't ever be disrespectful by not giving people time. Same in business. So as you said, be gracious at every point because you just don't know. And that was goes back to the fact that the person probably earning the least in a business are the most important. That would be the person who has to clean the toilets because that actually is really critical, whether it's in a big stadium or a restaurant or a business, because you know they care about the detail. The steward, the steward is doing this under pressure in a very difficult environment, not the highest paid, but him smiling, being helpful and being supportive, pre-match, post-match is critical. The guy in the car park, the guy in the car park, when you're trying to get out in a big queue, trying to organise, is yep. on the lowest basic wage. So it's really important. As you mentioned, that lady on reception or that man on reception was crucial. And I know, I'm 52 years old. I've met a lot of people. I've been very fortunate to have been asked to be involved in lots of charitable occasions, supporting different causes. Yeah. I've been invited to lots of dinners. I get to meet lots of people. And now I can judge and understand, not judge, I know whether someone's all right or not within the first 10, 15 minutes of a conversation. You know, yeah. you can kind of tell and people can't, you know, be somebody they're not. You've got to be genuine. And it does come out from a conversation, whether you're really the person you, you think you are. And so, I, you know, it resonates. So the time one, give people time, concentrate, you know, don't be dismissive. And yeah. because even though you've got, it might be that you've had a bad phone call, you've had something happened and we all have stuff going on in our lives. But when someone gives you that, that's maybe that only time they ever meet you as a support, mm. as a fan. And they're making that, you're either making their day or not making their day. And they're going to, it's the pyramid selling of this is what they think about you. And they've made that judgment in the couple of minutes you're giving them to either sign or listen or talk to them. And yeah. I've still got the piece of paper from Tom Lyons and he wrote that. And it is about give people time. And sometimes it's hard. It is hard. Yeah. And unfortunately, sometimes you have those tough lessons like that bloke did when he didn't be nice to the receptionist who happened to be the bloke exactly. who made the decision. And as long as you don't keep being like that, then you learn from it. It's a tough lesson. Sometimes it is, but life is about learning. It, it, exactly. And, and yeah, absolutely fantastic tips. I think we, we ended up with a bonus one there of, you know, time as well and giving people time. So uh, Rupert, I, you know, I could talk to you forever and a day on, on pick your brains on, on all the experience and, and the other legends that you played with um, throughout your time. But um, I, I, you know, no, we'll have to get you back for a second episode if we, if we can nail you down again. Yeah, look, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm, really, I'm very grateful you think about asking me and it's a um, uh, has been that never quite was, but it's, no. you know, I love talking about, I love talking about things that have happened, but I go back to the fact that if I can, from a point of view of rugby and in business, if I can, lots of more better people out there definitely can. So it is about just, hanging around with tidy people that will help you along the journey. And I'm still learning all the time. I'm sitting with people, talking to people, and these experiences from like we're talking to you, it's, it, you know, it's great to be asked. So thanks very much. No, I, I appreciate it. Look, guys, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Make sure you subscribe to the channel uh, for all the future episodes. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching. See you later.